Ah, the legend of freaking Zelda. It's really one of the best games. There's no wonder that comes in a solid gold cartridge, uh, which today is worth millions. I mean, you could smelt this down, smelt this down, and fill your teeth with gold, or buy a new house, or buy lots more copies of The Legend of Zelda. But today I want to talk about another kind of cartridge, one of these. Now these cartridges are no good, because they're made of three dimensions. And many games are quite good despite being 3D, like Super Mario 64, and indeed the Ocarina of Time. Uh, this is not actually the Ocarina of Time, this is a game called Biofreaks, which says right on it, property of Blockbuster. I think I might have gotten away with it by now. Let's pretend this is Ocarina of Time. It's a good game, really good game, but I have a problem. A lot of people tell me that they think this is the most zelda of the entire Legend of Zelda series. It's nonsense. And I think the reason they might think it's the most zelda is because this game is 2D and not 3D. So maybe we should just make this game 3D, then we can all enjoy it and agree that it's the most zelda -ist. And while we're at it, why not make all Nintendo games 3D? And why not do it in a way that doesn't require any labor, so it could just make it automatic? That way we can enjoy games without having to do any work. That's what this talk is about. Now, I'll tell you some disclaimers. One, I'm kind of running out of time here. Sigbovic is in two days. I just want to, I'm still working on this, but it's a little buggy, so you'll get to enjoy some of the bugs with me. I think they're kind of funny, but I think the ideas are sound. I'll also say, I, I'm pretty sure someone has tried this before. Maybe multiple people have tried this before, but I don't like to like research before I do work because it just takes the fun out of it. It sort of breaks your heart. I want to do it Tom way. Maybe time wise is good, maybe you'll have a good time. Um, but let's start. Welcome to Warp Zone. Ah, oh, the legend of freaking Zelda. Are you impressed yet? Let's just bask. Okay, actually, let's put our name in. To be fair, this is one flaw with this game, the stupid menu. I still can't. Okay, no, back to the <laughs> elimination mode. All right, here we are. So let's get three dimensional. Okay, now I'm a little disoriented. You gotta get in this cave here, or hole. This is a really good secret. You can get a sword uh, from this guy. And I really love how this guy just dies as soon as you take the sword. So we can have a moment of silence for that wizard. But I wanna show you something you're already missing out on. Link, we're having a moment of silence. Don't throw swords. Here's what that part looks like the right way. And that's what you're missing out on. I mean, look at that glorious melt face. Perfect graphics. Perfect. Alright, back to 3D here. Uh, so another issue is every time I face south, uh, like Link's big huge face is always right there because after all Link is on the screen and so I, I detect that as a sprite and draw it. Actually I have a solution to that problem, I'll show you. I'll show you a bit later, but in the meantime we'll just live with it like a like a kind of a ghost following you around. Or like your little brother. Or whatever. Now if you're very observant, you'll have noticed that I put the 2D... Oh wait, get that lady. Yeah. Put the 2D version of the game up at the top. And honestly, when I'm playing, I just keep looking at that because among other things, the controls are still set up so that when I press up, I go up, not forward. Oh wait, get that sword. Can you get another sword? Get it. Uh, uh, alas, the user interface is perpetually out of reach. Like a metaphor for life itself. Now here's a problem. Um, those statues you might expect to be sort of upright. And that's because I never actually said what those statues should look like, so it sort of defaults to floor. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next part where I talk about how this works. Yeah. How about, let's save. I feel like that was good progress. Okay, so now I want to teach you how that works. This involves knowing a little bit about how the Nintendo works, which is good for us anyway. Okay, that drawing is just to comfort us. Now inside the Nintendo, of course, is a CPU. And like all central processing unit, this thing processes centers. Now if the CPU itself tried to render the video, we'd have a big problem. There's just way too many pixels on the screen in order to store it in RAM, and the CPU is way too slow to even get close to 60 frames per second. So it turns out that there's also a picture processing unit. And the picture processing unit is what actually renders the video over NTSC and sends it over channel 3 or 4 to your television. And the CPU and PPU coordinate all of this via three regions of kind of shared memory. 
the pattern table, the name table, and the object attribute memory, which I don't know why it's not a table. So that means there's an intermediate representation of the game's scene within this memory. And in order to make games 3D, what I do is interpret these three tables plus main memory in order to reconstruct the geometry of the scene, the textures, the objects within it, and understand where the camera position should be, and so on. First, let's talk about the name table. The name table is just a grid. It has 32 entries across and 30 entries down. And each entry just has a number, which tells us what picture is inside that part of the screen. Now, the pictures themselves are going to come from the pattern table. But before we even look at the pictures, we can do something to make this 3D. Let's zoom in on a section and do an example. We actually make blocks on the basis of two by two groups of tiles. And the reason for that is going to become clear later, but that's the size of a question mark block in Super Mario Brothers um, for your reference. So let's say that we have the rule that if it's a zero, if it contains a zero, it's going to be floor, and otherwise it'll be a wall. Now every group of four tiles will become a box, and let's say that we're looking at this scene from the top left corner. But the height of that box will be determined by the numbers it contains. So it could either be low or high if it's a wall. And so this entire grid gets turned into a number of boxes. So if we know which things are supposed to be walls and which are supposed to be floor, we can do this. And here's what that looks like. By the way, I programmed this thing in GL, of course. And I used super retro GL, like version 1.1, because I wanted to make good on a pun, which is the title of this work. The GL end of Zelda. If you're a graphics person, hopefully you understand that, in addition to being embarrassed by my wireframes here. And don't worry, there will be more to be embarrassed at soon. But even just reading the name table, you can get a picture of how this could be 3D. Next, let's look at the pattern table to add some textures to this. By the way, I'm simplifying several things here. For example, there's really two pattern tables, but only one of them will be used for the background. And the pattern table is just a collection of 8x8 pictures that can be used by the name table to draw the screen. Each picture has a number, and the same picture could be used many, many times on the same screen, or not at all. So if these four pictures, which probably wouldn't actually be next to each other in the pattern table, were next to one another in the name table, you'd get that same picture appearing on the screen. And that's how the whole screen is filled up. Now each one of these pictures doesn't actually know what colors it should be. That information is also stored in that extra bottom part of the name table. Yielding this amazing fact, the cloud is made of the same exact tiles as the bush. Huh. Now there's not a lot of room in the Nintendo's memory for this color information. So there's a rule, which is that you can't change the color for each tile, only for each group of four tiles, like that tree. You'll see the consequences of this rule in lots of NES graphics. And it's the reason why I use two by two tiles to form blocks, because that just tends to be how the Nintendo graphics are arranged. So now every 3D box gets on all four of its sides this same texture. Let's take a look. Sorry for the pandering. Blowing in a cartridge just does nothing. You do have to avoid having bugs, otherwise you get glitches, obviously. But even with glitches, you've already seen this game. How about a nice game of global thermonuclear war? I can only assume someone's made first-person Tetris before, taking all the fun out of it for the rest of us. And although it sort of found the camera here, it's kind of facing out the butt. So I can turn it around manually there. Now we're heading down into the pieces. And now you'll see I've already failed because I told you everything was going to be in these two by two groups of blocks, but it turns out Tetris pieces aren't like that. So, no good. This makes the game considerably harder, especially since I can't even see the shape of the, the pieces there. But I thought of an alternate title for this work. Wolfnestein 3D. What do you think? All right, all right, all right. All right, one more thing about rendering, and then we're going to talk about how to make this automatic. And I told you there were three things. The third is the object attribute memory. And these are the sprites. These are the things that can move around on the screen. There can be 64 of them, and there's so many rules. I don't want to get into it. It's very complicated. But each sprite basically has some picture associated with it from the pattern table, and then it knows its coordinates on the screen. The main thing that makes 3D sprites tricky is the fact that the things that move around the screen are often made up of multiple sprites. So here's a little monster that's made up of two sprites right next to one another. 
If I treat those sprites independently in 3D, then they just come apart, and that looks totally bogus. So, I do something that I'll call Sprite Fusion, where on every frame I take all the sprites that are exactly lined up with one another, and I fuse them into a mega sprite. For example, this crappy mother brain would all get fused into one mega sprite, because all its sprites are lined up exactly in a grid. But these bubbles get to be their own sprites, because they're not lined up exactly, even if they're touching or overlapping the brain. So if I do this, then it looks totally righteous. This unicorn here is made of like 12 sprites fused together. But zounds, another problem. All of the sprites are oriented like they would be on the screen, and for my sword, this is really stupid. Or awesome. Ha! So now another important game, Super Mario Brothers. Here I'm playing Super Mario Brothers with the settings that made Zelda 3D, which aren't right for this game. The camera's up in the top left corner at coordinates 0, 0, and Mario is walking on the sky, and even weirder, these blocks are just going to start appearing out of nowhere, which has to do with scrolling. Scrolling is interesting, uh, and a pain in our 3D butts, but I'm going to skip that topic for today, and instead concentrate on how can we make this process more automatic, or totally automatic because I don't want to have to manually decide which things are floor, which things are wall, and where is the camera, and so on, for every single game. So let me show you Super Mario Bros. the right way while I talk about that. So I decided there's really two different views of a Nintendo game. There's like Zelda view, which is top down, and there's Mario view, which is from the side. And if you look at the graphics on tiles, like letters, for example, you'll probably come to the same conclusion. So part of what we're going to try to do is figure out whether it's a top view game or a side view game. Another thing we need to know is where is the camera? So where are Mario's eyeballs? And is he looking to the right or to the left? Or in the case of Zelda, north, south, east, or west? And then the hardest part, which is to figure out which are walls and which are floors so that I can position the blocks correctly in 3D space. Oh, this is so stressful. By the way, these games are super hard first person. Like I know exactly where I am in this level. I played it a thousand times, but that, that next turtle is, oh my, okay, no. Jump. Now maybe I can get up on that ledge where it's safe with the coins. Ah. To do this automatically, we're going to need a powerful tool, really the best tool, science. Specifically, we're going to run a series of experiments in order to determine the parameters of the specific game we're playing. An experiment works like this. Remember, we're running the game in an emulator, so we can save our state and try two different things out and see what happens in each branch. So for example, the first experiment I do is to try holding left and try holding right. And what I'm trying to do is figure out which sprite or sprites I control as the player. So if I hold left, my sprite should move to the left, and if I hold right, it should move to the right, which means that its x-coordinates should go down and up, respectively. Once I know which sprite I am, I can run a whole bunch of experiments to determine which main memory locations control the position of that sprite. In each arm of the experiment, I'm only going to keep the memory locations whose values are consistent with the sprite location, which I know. As usual, it's much more complicated than this. The sprite might be offset from its true location in memory by some constant, or the scroll position, so you really have to solve a system of equations. And really, the sprite's position will be in multiple places in RAM. For example, there's a region of memory that's used to set the sprite memory via DMA. And we want to ignore those places, so we have to do some kind of causality analysis to understand which is the real location. But if we succeed at this, then we have an even more powerful tool. Total control over the rules of physics. Okay, just teleportation. But teleportation is pretty great. Here we found Link's camera, and that means that we can actually change the memory locations manually, which is what I'm doing right here. And I could just put Link anywhere I want, so I can find out if I can get that damn sword. Okay, you can't get it. Or I can run experiments where I move the player up and drop him and see if there's gravity, which is one of the ways I determine whether it's a side view or a top view game. Or I can mess up and kill Mario because there's some bugs still. Or we can go figure out what's over here on the edge of the map, because I've always kind of, are you kidding me? You just start over, huh? But the most useful kind of experiment is to warp the player around the screen and test whether the player can move. Here, Link is stuck, so that kind of tile is probably a wall. And over here, Link can move. So that kind of tile is probably a floor. So if I run tens of thousands of warping and moving experiments and other threads, then I can map out the solidity of the tiles and make the game 3D automatically. Well, maybe. This is what it looks like for Zelda, totally automatically. And it kind of works, but there's something about the pixel offset that you're standing at that makes it strobe in and out of phase. 
So I'm still working on this. This is this week's uh, buggy version. But there are at least some games where it does work. This is a game called Adventures of Lolo, which is a great puzzle game. I really recommend it. And this 3Dification was totally automatic using the techniques I just described. So I think with a little refinement, this actually could work for a lot more games. And spoiler alert, while making games 3D is supremely important, you could probably imagine how understanding where the player is and where the walls are is also useful for things like video game AIs, which you may know is another one of my interests. So stay tuned. But now I just want to leave you with my favorite bug from a classic, The Karate Kid. Oh, oh yeah. That is 3D. Hmm, no bonus.